Good afternoon. On behalf of Professor Esther de Becker Grupp, I would like to warmly welcome you to this. We have an echo, so I'll pause for a minute until the echo is solved. Let's start again. On behalf of Esther de Becker, I would like to warmly welcome you to this festive symposium preceding her inaugural lecture. Also welcome to our online uh, audience who's watching the live stream. Esther is the reason that we are here today. She's the leading lady and we're looking forward to hearing her lecture and seeing her shine at 4 p.m. this afternoon. And she's treating us today on this festive symposium entitled Choosing Carefully Patient Preferences in Healthcare Decision Making from Theory to Practice. And it has a great lineup. And I'm glad to see that many of you choose to attend this uh, symposium to stay in line with the choice language uh, of Esther. Before we start, I would like to thank the sponsors of this event. And I would also like to remind the speakers to stay within the time uh, allotted so that, that we can stop at 10 past three and walk to the Ola together. If you don't know where the Ola is, don't worry, you just have to follow us. There will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after each presentation. That also applies to the online audience. You can put your questions in the chat. And we have two people in the room here, Lucas Goossens and Vivian Rekkers, who will monitor the chat and who will select the, the questions for the speakers. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to uh, Professor uh, Diana Delnoy from uh, our National Healthcare Institute, who is the Chief Scientific Officer there. The floor is yours, Diana. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Maureen, for this introduction. And thank you, Esther, for inviting me to speak at this symposium. I'm really honored, and uh, I am looking forward to hearing your inaugural lecture later this afternoon. So uh, before I continue with my talk, I would first like to start with a short movie about the National Healthcare Institute that tells you what it is that we do. Yes. Every person in the Netherlands is entitled to healthcare offered in the basic care package. We all contribute to this through our health insurance. The National Healthcare Institute determines and advises on which types of healthcare are included in the basic package and which are not. Treatment possibilities and their related costs have increased in recent years and will continue to increase. These treatments are also often used for a broader group of patients. The Care Institute therefore wants to draw more attention to how insured care can be offered, who receives which care. Professionals largely determine what type of care to offer for which health issue. But is this care necessary and effective for every patient? Is appropriate care being applied? To determine this, we need to focus on what takes place in the consultation room, where the doctor and patient together decide on the best treatment. This requires good collaboration with professionals and patients on the application of appropriate care. We encourage healthcare parties to structure their guidelines and quality standards to provide the individual patient with the proper care. We do this together with scientific organizations, as well as healthcare providers, patient organizations, and health insurers. In other words, we continuously monitor the scope of the basic package. We also call for greater focus on collaboration to ensure appropriate care. 
This enables us to reduce pressure on the boundaries of the package and keep the insured care accessible, of good quality and affordable, now and in the future. Taking care of good healthcare. No more and no less than necessary. Yeah, so I hope that was very clear. I think it's always easier to have someone explain it in a short video than talk yourself about what it is that you do. But the main message uh, that this video wants to display is that it, we see it as our mission at the National Healthcare Institute to keep healthcare accessible, keep it of good quality, and keep it affordable. <coughs> Before I go into more detail on uh, how we do that and what the place of patient preferences is in, uh, in the work that we do, uh, let me first show you how the public, the, the Dutch public, feels about our mission to keep healthcare accessible and affordable. So what are the public preferences? We recently commissioned a study at the National Healthcare Institute in which citizens' attitudes and ideas regarding affordability are being explored. And uh, the consultants from stakeholder labs who conducted, who are conducting this study, they came back with some interesting preliminary results. And those pre preliminary results are based on a survey of 50 respondents and interviews with these people. And um, what is interesting to see is that, first of all, members of the public see affordability as the most pressing problem in healthcare in the Netherlands. 48% of the people prioritize this, followed by accessibility, 32%, and quality, 24%. However, what became clear from the interviews was that people find it difficult to distinguish between affordability and accessibility, because they say, well, if you don't have money to pay for healthcare, you don't have access, which I think also illustrates that probably if they think about affordability, they are thinking, first of all, about their own ability to pay and not about the, the for affordability as a country of a, uh, for the country as a whole. So it's also good to mention that in this case, the response options were closed. So it was a closed question. Maybe if it had been an open question, I guess uh, members of the public would have also mentioned manpower problems uh, particularly the shortage of nurses as a, as a problem in healthcare, but they didn't have that choice. The public have uh, also different opinions when it comes to rationing. Um, in general, there is consensus among the respondents in this survey about the need uh, to, to avoid waste in healthcare. But if the public are forced to choose between either cuts in the basic benefits package or cuts on other public health care expenditures or uh, raising premiums, then um, the, the majority chooses to cut back on other health care expenditures such as um, climate change or uh, uh, development aid or housing, or they choose to raise premiums. So I was a bit surprised by this finding, but then I realized we, we should probably be cautious about these results because first of all, as I said, it's a, a preliminary, prelim, <laughs> preliminary finding based on only 50 uh, respondents and uh, a larger survey is conducted currently. But um, I think in this case also uh, that it was a closed response option. And I guess it's possible that respondents see cutbacks on other expenditures as an easy response, response option in, in the context of this survey, because they can actually tick that box without having to think further about exactly how uh, these cutbacks and where these cutbacks on other expenditures should take place. So they don't have to trade off the different types of expenditures. Uh, however, uh, I show it to you because it um, illustrates that the public probably finds it uncomfortable to cut benefits from the basic benefits package. I now see that something has gone wrong with the, with the slide, but the middle category is cutting back on the benefits package in healthcare. And, and the fact that the public, the, 
the public doesn't choose that option uh, illustrates that they find it uncomfortable to do that. And, and that implies that it is up to us, uh, the academics and policymakers, to do a better job in explaining to the public, first of all, that there are more forms of waste than the obvious uh, things like duplicating x-rays or uh, ordering or prescribing drugs or other medical aids that are being thrown away. And it's also up to us to explain to the public that population health isn't only produced through healthcare, but that things like um, a moderate climate or healthy living conditions or stable jobs or something like the absence of war, which we took too granted for too long, I guess, that those things uh, also affect population health and that therefore crowding out effects of healthcare expenditures can actually have a negative effect on healthcare. Ultimately, it is not up to the National Healthcare Institute, where I work, to decide exactly how much public money should be spent on healthcare. That is essentially a political decision. But our job is to ensure that the money that is available the money that we do have, is spent wisely and is spent on appropriate care. So how do we define appropriate care and what role do patient preferences play in appropriate care? I must say that we use a rather broad definition currently of what appropriate care is because we say appropriate care is value-driven, that is, it produces patient-relevant outcomes at societally acceptable costs. But appropriate care is also organized in a process of shared decision making in which professionals and patients together decide what is appropriate in this specific case. And appropriate care is delivered in the right place, that is to say in primary care if that is possible uh, or digitally if that is possible. And fourth of all, it focuses on health and prevention of illness instead of on illness. And we see these four principles as an integrated set, so that and a set of criteria that should be balanced simultaneously in order to specify what is appropriate care in a given context. And on the individual level, this contextualization takes place in the process of shared decision making, as it was said in the, in the video in the consultation room. And important steps in that process of shared decision making are providing information about the available options, um, the alternatives, but also exploring patients' preferences in the so-called decision talk. And exploring patient preferences means that you ask what matters most to the patient. Since 2015, the National Healthcare Institute has been running a program uh, in order to stimulate shared decision making. And in this program, we have 5 million euro available every year for grants. And by now, we have been subsidizing 60 or more innovative projects in which information on outcomes of care is being used to support shared decision making. In 2019, we evaluated the first four years of this grant program. And this graph here shows the shift over time in the topics that the innovative projects addressed. In 2015, the projects were mainly about disclosing information about the quality of care that was being provided and about creating the conditions for doing so, for instance, working on websites. In later years, the project focused much more on training patients and professionals uh, for uh, um, employing and implementing uh, shared decision making. And particularly in 2018, the project focused on the actual implementation of shared decision making. But what you can also see uh, in the, the bright yellow bar, uh, parts of the bars is that exploring patients' needs, preferences and experiences was project also uh, present also in projects and that was mainly the case in 2016 and 2017. In those years, 
um, exploring patients' preferences, needs and experiences uh, took up about one third of the grant money. So um, the National Healthcare Institute has been involved for almost eight years now in promoting shared decision making. However, as I said previously, we see these four criteria, these four principles of appropriate care as an integrated set. So ideally, patients and professionals in the process of shared decision making cannot choose any given intervention that they like, that is, if they want that intervention to be paid from, from the public insurance. Instead, they choose from a menu that is composed of effective and cost-effective interventions. And they choose from a menu uh, that might specify, for instance, that you first need to try physiotherapy as a starter before you can have hip replacement as your main course. And it's the National Healthcare Institute the, the national HDA agency that uses health technology assessment to determine what dishes should be on the menu of the public health insurance benefits package. Health technology assessment, uh, I'm sure the majority of you knows that, but it's, uh, I'll define it shortly anyway. It's a multidisciplinary process that uses explicit methods to determine the value of a health technology. And health technology can be anything ranging from a pharmaceutical to a medical device, medical procedures, or even health policy. And patient and public involvement in HDA is very important because, I got everything mixed up, because it's essential to to understand and assess the wider implications of the reimbursement decisions that we're taking, uh, to understand the implications for those that are most affected, uh, affected, so patients and the public. So we have to think of ways of, of um, involving the patients and the public in our decision making. So in HDA worldwide, there are generally two approaches by which you can do that. One approach is to have patient organizations at the table when you take the decisions. And the other approach is to collect evidence on patient value or on patient preferences directly from the patients or their proxies, for instance, using discrete choice experiments or other met uh, methods. Now, for this talk, I explicitly checked with a number of colleagues who have experience, hands-on experience in doing HDA in our institute uh, to ask which of these approaches that we use at the National Healthcare Institute. I already suspected the answer and I was right because they, they told me that the second option has really not often been used in our institute. There were a few cases in which patient preference data were supplied, for instance, about the ease of uh, use, for instance, new modes of administering a certain drug. But unless there is hard evidence that such a new mode of administration uh, leads to better adherence or to better outcomes. Such preferences do not really change uh, the result of our assessment. So at the National Healthcare Institute, our um, main mode of patient involvement is the first one. We invite patient, part, uh, patient organizations to participate in our assessment. We may ask for their input in the scoping phase of an assessment where uh, we determine which are the relevant outcomes that we are looking for and we solicit their comments on the draft assessments that we make. So, in an ideal world, patient organizations are always involved in our assessment process. But I must admit that in practice, this fair eyes. Uh, Paulus Lips uh, worked uh, for a year at the Section Healthcare Governance of the Erasmus School of Health Policy and Management, he conducted a document analysis of 20 assessments of pharmaceuticals that the National Healthcare Institute did in 2019. And it turned out that in these cases, um, as you can see on the slide, patient organizations were often involved in the, uh, in, 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 the, in the phase where we asked for the comments on the draft report, but they were not often involved in the scoping phase of an assessment. 
So that is the phase where we determine which are patient-relevant outcomes that we should be looking for. Uh, our experts who are doing the pharmaceutical assessments do see more involvement as desirable, but they also say that time pressure stands in the way of more interaction with stakeholders. Now, in addition to having patients involved in the assessment of pharmaceuticals, which, as you see here, mostly happens when we ask for the comments on a draft assessment, we see more use cases for information on patient preferences. For example, we can use that information as input for our agenda and our policy. And we are interested in the possibilities of quantitative methods to elicit patient and public preferences, but we also see the value of qualitative methods. Uh, currently, the section Healthcare government, Governance is working on an advice for us on how we can use information from patient stories in our agenda and how we can use it in our policy. And in my own work here at the uh, Erasmus School of Health Policy and Management, um, I work with master's students who focus on the use of patient stories in social media, for instance in blogs, uh, to assess the content validity of patient reported outcome measures. What you see here are the results from a number of qualitative analysis of patient blogs, but I must admit I show them in a very quantitative way. Um, because while well, encoding the patient stories in the, in the patient blocks, the students use really detailed code books because uh, the, uh, the codes emerge from the data and, they're, and they're, uh, actually a new code book is made for every uh, single patient group. But in order to be able to summarize it here, I grouped the codes into uh, a number of um, yeah, overarching themes and uh, that enables me to show you that Patients in their blogs write about a whole number of things. They write about their physical functioning and health. They write about their mental well-being, about the, the social network and how that supports them. They write about their daily life, how they go to school, to work, etc. And uh, they write about how they cope and self-manage. And it's interesting that you can use this information from patient stories to compare the things that they talk about in the blogs in this case with what is being uh, uh, addressed in patient reported outcome measures. What the students do is that they compare their the results of their qualitative analysis with the PROMS patient reported outcome measures that are recommended by the International Consortium for Health Outcome Measurements, ITROM. And that's a global effort which aims at setting standards for measuring patient outcomes. And if you compare that, what you generally see, first of all, is that the majority of topics that are being addressed in PROMS are also mentioned in the blocks. So you could say that overall, uh, the content validity of PROMS is adequate. Uh, however, often you need a combination of two or three PROMS for a certain disease uh, category to cover all the aspects that are relevant for patients. Uh, and in addition, there is not only overlap between what patients talk about in the, in the blogs and what is being covered by the PROMS. Because uh, for most of these patient groups, PROMS also addressed topics that were not mentioned in the blogs. And so you might argue that these topics are redundant. And vice versa, it is also the case that bloggers talk about issues um, that we don't find in the PROMS. For instance, um, problems with fertility and pregnancy support are mentioned by bloggers uh, who blog about breast cancer, but they're not covered in any of the three breast cancer prompts that are recommended by ITROM. And similarly, something like side effects of drugs and flares are not covered in the prompts for rheumatoid arthritis. So examples like these show that patient stories are an interesting source of information that can be analyzed with qualitative methods and that can be used in addition to quantitative sources of information or even to validate more quantitative measures of patient experiences, such as PROMS. So I'll come to a conclusion. The National Healthcare Institute, the Dutch HDA agency, aims to promote appropriate care. Appropriate care should be 
uh, able to produce patient-relevant outcomes at societally acceptable costs. And it is organized in a process of shared decision-making in which both the context as well as the preferences of patients are taken into account. The National Healthcare Institute uses soft governance in the form of a grant program to stimulate shared decision-making and to stimulate the measurement of patient-relevant outcomes in Dutch healthcare. In its HDA process, the National Healthcare Institute relies on patient participation, formal patient participation by patient organizations, uh, who we invite to give their input in our assessment process. And we do that mainly in the phase where they can comment on a draft report. In practice, we see that this is often hampered by time pressure. So it's not common in our assessments of pharmaceuticals to collect evidence on patient value and experiences from patients directly, but we do see the added value of such information, for example, as input for our agenda or other policy uh, issues. And we are open to using a variety of sources for, for collecting that information, quantitative, qualitative, or a combination of the two. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Diana, for this uh, great kickoff of this uh, symposium. Uh, the floor is now open for questions, and I encourage the audience online to put your questions in the chat. But let's start here in the room. Is there a question for Diana? Ewout Steyerberg. Thanks, uh, Marleen. Uh, thanks, Diana. This is a really great start, I think, for this, uh, this overview picture of and the really high level of what the government does. Uh, I was intrigued by this tension on, say, the high level societal perspective and also what you mentioned, the individual perspective and what's really going on this shared decision making. And specifically, I would like to ask you to explore a bit more on, on this issue of evidence that is used for individuals, that there's tension on you learn on group level, but you want to apply on the individual level. How, how do, should we deal with that? What's your perspective on that? How can we make that better? Oh, well, thank you very much. That, that's a great question, uh, and I must say that we are intrigued as well, <laughs> in the sense that it is um, sometimes conceptually diff difficult to reconcile uh, the, the two approaches, but also statistically, methodologically, I think uh, um, that, for example, PROMS, who are perfectly capable uh, to be used to compare groups of patients, uh, cannot always be used to predict um, the outcome of an individual patient in a certain case. So um, that means that there is a lot of methodological work, work that needs to be done. And what we have been doing um, at the National Healthcare Institute is, uh, as part of a larger uh, European study, the uh, Health Techno Next Generation Health Technology Assessment, HTX project, we uh, prepared um, a PROM toolbox and uh, a, a PROM a database of PROMs where people who are interested in using a PROM for a certain use case that can be comparing groups, but it can also be predicting individual outcomes, can look at the evidence that there is for these uh, measuring instruments on those use cases, because you can't just go ahead and, and use them. I agree. Yeah. Other questions? Is there a question in the chat? OK. Thanks uh, for, for a very nice presentation indeed. Um, I was wondering, you, um, when you refer to using blogs to kind of flesh out what patients find important, um, it reminds me of a, of a situation that happens in uh, public transport studies um, where something similar was done and travelers' blogs were being kind of text mined to see what they really cared about. But in the end, it turned out that people tend to blog about what they don't like, right? They tend to blog about negative experiences more than about positive ones. And in this particular case, it turned out that people blogged a lot about noisy fellow travelers, about chewing gum on seats, that kind of stuff. And that made the public transport company almost conclude that timetables um, and the frequency of buses and trams weren't really important. But of course, they are, but they're quite good. And people don't tend to blog and say, hey, my bus is on, was on time today. Um, do we face a similar risk here? Uh, well, thank you for that, for that question. Um, in analyzing the blogs, we didn't really see that people only talked about negative things. They, patients write about 
what it is, how it is to live your life with a certain disease and the things that you uh, that you experience then. Um, but I think we should be careful by um, trying to derive any importance from what people write about. I mean, uh, that, that's also something that I talk about with the students when they're doing, uh, when they're working on their thesis. You can't assume that something is important because they write about it. It sort of underlies the work that we do in the sense that, well, we argue if it's not important at all, they wouldn't probably write about it if it's trivial. But you, you can't make a rank or order of, of things that they find more or less Hear important. Hear a lot about yeah. importance yeah. measurements uh, yeah. in, in the remainder of the symposium. Diana, if I may, if I hear you talk about appropriate care and, and, and patient relevant uh, outcomes, it, it, I get the impression that uh, Zin is broadening the scope of outcome measurements to include outcomes that we currently do not include in our cost utility uh, analysis. Is, is my impression right? And, and how do you see then this link between appropriate care and, and cost effectiveness analysis? I don't think we are substituting other outcomes for the outcomes that you need for cost uh, effectiveness or cost utility analysis, broaden but we broaden it, yes. But we, are, we also very much like to cherish the instruments that we have, and that instruments include uh, uh, relative effectiveness assessment and cost effectiveness assessment. So um, the, the balance of the measures that you need for doing those analyses is also is something that is really um, difficult for us, because on the one hand, if you want to measure what is most relevant to patient, you, you mostly end up with really disease-specific instruments, but if you want to look at cost effectiveness, you need an EQ5D. And so how you balance that without dri driving both patients and professionals crazy with everything you want to measure, that's really a tough question. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. All right. Is there a question from the online audience? If, if not, then uh, we move to the second speaker. And thank, uh, you. thank you very much. Uh, Diana, there's some chocolate for you over there. Thank you very much again. Let me introduce uh, Professor Peter Moll. He's Professor of Drug Regulatory Science uh, from the Medicines Evaluation Board and uh, the University Medical Center in Groningen and also part of the European Medicines Agency. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, I'm very pleased to be talking here today. Um, and I think I need uh, first of all, obviously, congratulations, Esther. Um, I think uh, I hope to do this also in the next couple of months, a talk like this, uh, on what I think is, is good uh, uh, things in, 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 in regulatory science, as I also got my appointment not that long ago. Uh, but I think um, I'm, I'm here to talk about the role of the patient. And, and yes, you may have seen this uh, before, because I used to prefer at one of the kickoff meetings, I think, because obviously, we do as regulators. We feel that this patient is important. And uh, actually the EMA, and I must say, you see at the European level, these things are usually worked out a little bit better than we do that at the national level. There's a lot more thinking going into that. But already from the conception of the, of the EMA at 1996, there was a dialogue organized with patients that became increasingly structured and involved in, in the different phases. How does that now look like? Because I think um, many of you will know that regulators will approve a medicine based on a positive benefit and risk, and we were all waiting for the vaccine to be approved so we could get out of our homes. And finally, we, we do now, maybe not only due to the vaccines, but we do a little bit more than the evaluation phase where also the patient perception could come in. We also have this, this whole pre-submission part. And, and in the pre-submission part, this is especially where I, I work in at the European level, where we talk with companies about the drug development programs and where we have at that stage, we want to hear, okay, what do patients think of what the company is going to investigate, how the drug works, what are the outcomes that they are looking at. And for instance, um, um, my colleagues at the EMA did a sort of analysis also of what his input of, of patients meant. So we, we talked to a company, we have a, a dossier every month, about 50 to 100 these days, 
uh, where we talk about drug development programs and, and patients give input on a number of the more contentious kind of programs. And what is here is, is, is where they uh, interact on, they give input on population and, and study, no, not so much on the feasibility, a little less, but on endpoints, obviously. And actually, in 25% of all those advice where patients participate, some changes were made to, to the outcome. So, so especially, I think, on populations, are these the right populations to study? And on the um, endpoints, there's a lot of input. Um, my agency, the Dutch Medicines Evaluation Board, also felt it's really important that we should talk about this. And already in uh, 2015, we had a very nice meeting at the, uh, at the Dutch uh, CBG, uh, talking with different people, also patient representatives, this is for the uh, rare disease uh, patients, talking about where patients come into the decision making. And of course, yes, we talked already, uh, Diana talked already a bit about patient reported outcomes. Clearly, we do get this patient uh, reported outcome into our uh, report. So we, we listen in principle already a bit. But yes, I know, I know, I also brought this issue up when we discussed with IMI Prefer, and I'll come back to that, uh, Esther, later, um, that there is clearly a difference between patient preferences and the patient reported outcome, where the qualitative and quantitative statements of the acceptability and attributes that differ among the health interventions is really something that comes from the preferences where the PRO is much more the outcome measure. But before I go into really talking a little bit more about what patient, uh, the patient preferences do in our decision making, I wanted to take you quickly through what we do as regulators. And I'm aware that, that Diana had a very nice film. I will do it. Uh, with slides. Um, well, we like to have two double-blind randomized controlled trials, preferably to base our decisions on. And there we throw the patient out, actually, because we like to have these patients distributed equally so they don't contribute so much to the, to the information, but that you really look at the drug factors, because these patients in one and the other group are very similar, so they don't play a major role. Um, and we do that based on uh, development uh, for our medicine. It goes from looking at uh, small-scale studies in the pharmaceutical quality of the medicine, uh, doing some non-clinical work, then starting to do trials. We look at the data, approve it, and then we're, the company is going to scale up its production. And finally, uh, we look in practice how the drug behaves. And we can make a decision on efficacy, safety from that. We do that here nowadays in the Netherlands. Well, virtually, obviously, uh, at the moment, but this is the EMA building in, in Amsterdam. And importantly, it's not a European office with European um, administrators doing that work. It's a network of 27 national competent authorities. So each country is bringing in the expertise. So it's Netherlands, Germany, France, Italy, and so on. They bring into the different committees uh, people that talk and make the decisions. And we take some time for that. We have a fixed timeline to do that. Okay, we did it a little faster for the vaccines, but this is how it goes, 210 days of assessment time. And we do every time the same trick. We go into each study that is being performed and look at it. Was the objective of the study clear? Was the design of the study helping to understand the objective? Were the analysis correct? Was the study performed well? And what is then the conclusion on that? And then you get something like this on the vaccines. We see uh, before treatment, very little immunogenicity. And after treatment, a very big response. Good. Uh, similarly, uh, a lipid-lowering drug that I usually like to use as an example, where 55 to 70 percent of your LDLC, the bad cholesterol, is lowered. And if you compare it to an active treatment, Diana will like that because they did an active comparison, it's about still 30 to 40 to 45 percent. Yeah, but lipid-lowering, immune response, what does that really mean? It's a biomarker. And what is the clinical relevance? So we ask for clinical trials to look at outcomes. And this is a vaccine trial for, for Pfizer, Bio, BioNTech. And we see that uh, clearly 
many more patients got COVID, disease, uh, COVID uh, symptomatic disease versus patients uh, in the uh, treatment arms. Well, we needed 40,000 patients to show that, so that's a bit of the downside, but that is the reason why biomarkers can be convenient. But in the end, we always need adverse events. This is the data on the adverse events of the BioNTech. So you look at these data and start weighing, weighing what is important. You compare favorable, unfavorable effects. You try to explain these. Do the favorable effects outweigh the unfavorable effects? And what is the minimum condition? How should you be using the drug? So that is the indication and the summary of product, summary of product characteristics. I can, never can pronounce that word. Uh, but these are published on the website, and these indicate of the EMA and of the Dutch Medicines Evaluation Board telling you how to use that drug. And we do that about 30 to 40 times a year for really novel active substances. We approve many more drugs, but they aren't new uh, additions, really. And yes, for the vaccines, we did that faster. Normally, all these phases that I showed you take some while, up to 10 years, and here everything was compressed, a large amount of money was thrown on it, we reassessed faster, and it came indeed earlier to the market. And there's always this tension, do we do it fast enough or not? Some groups say, I have really an untreatable disease, or we want to have treatments fast on the market, and some will complain that this is costing too much and that we don't have the evidence really to decide what we are doing. We are over-treating patients, perhaps. Uh, but basically, um, if you keep on continuing collecting data, you will avoid all kinds of harm, but the benefit to public health diminishes because you're delaying entry of the new drug to the market. Sorry, I'm blinding somebody with the pointer. Um, but it's always been this. We always do it wrong, not fast enough, and I think it's the uh, same to Zin. Uh, so this was the director of the FDA a number of years ago. It still applies. And importantly, um, if a drug comes to the market, yes, we have had uh, limited information on the safety. We have a lot of focus on efficacy. Safety is, is sort of evaluated, but real numbers of patients are being coming to the, only after the approval. And so we monitor the me medicines after they are on the market. We call it pharmacovigilance, and that's what we do. So back to Esther, back to patient preferences. And when, is these when are these data now most needed, the patient experience data? And we think it may be indeed in these reassessments. Natalizumab was a case, Tisabri, where there was this horrible side effect uh, that occurred of the drug. But the drug was also very efficacious compared to everything else on the market. So the patients really brought it back to the market. So in the safety setting, it's possible. It's also possible in the efficacy setting, where you have a little bit more of a complex decision making. And I'll get back to that, because also, with the vaccines, probably still on your mind, it was already more than a year ago, so maybe things have happened. Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine worked, but it also caused these strange clots, and we detected that, and what should you be doing with that? So, so there was thrombos thrombosis occurring. Well, this happened too, and I have to always show my, my closest co-worker, Dr. Victoria Starokoshko, who just got a family from Kharkiv uh, this week, so um, we'll not linger on that, but I think, uh, also very important uh, things happen, unfortunately, at the same time. So back to the vaccine and the uh, adverse effects. Uh, you can always say, OK, we present what it does in benefit. It prevents hospitalization. This is in a high infection rate area where hospitalizations are prevented. And these are different age classes. So you see in the youngest age classes, very few hospitalizations in the elderly over 80, very many people hospitalized. And the risk for the clots actually is a little higher in the younger population. So the benefit risk obviously changes. And that especially is also context uh, dependent. If you have a low infection rate, it's you actually much less benefit. And the benefit risk weighing becomes more complex. I always present when I give, teach to students this one first. Change of the guideline for treating patients with high cholesterol. And if you do that, what we have now, we have lowered uh, the, to which we want to reach, 1.8 millimoles per liter. And then you see that you prevent four cases. Oh, sorry, the, it's looking nicer on the screen there. <laughs> but four out of 100 patients are being prevented to get an MI or a, a, 
uh, stroke. And what you see, the blue people are the ones that experience adverse events. And you have so, again, these apples and oranges that you have to decide on. And I think that is where the patient preferences really become handy. Because now you can start to learn what, are is, what is now being valued by the patient. Uh, I, I did a stu small study myself a number of years ago where we looked for a diabetes drug and different effects it caused uh, glucose lowering and cardiovascular outcomes. And we saw that patients compared to doctors and to regulators uh, valued a little bit more the symptomatic adverse events. Otherwise, they were relatively well in agreement. But you see it's also, again, dependent on the context. We, we repeated that study in Turkey uh, and saw that uh, Turkish uh, uh, patients really had a different view. Uh, they were much more driven by the impact on cardiovascular outcomes and not so much by any of the safety concerns. And again, uh, a colleague, Dao Posmus and, and Hans Hillige, performed a study around melanoma with the EMA, and they saw that there was a big spread in, in the responses. You see a very big plus, uh, spread of, of how patients feel about different aspects of the drug. Um, so look at the heterogeneity. And I think then we come really to the way how you elicit patient preferences. Um, because there are many ways of involving patients, but the individual patient sitting at a meeting might not do it. And so also at global level, we realize there must be something changing in this way. And the ICH, International Conference on Harmonization, brought up this paper where it is expressed that we should start working as global regulators and global industry to look at how you capture patient reported outcomes and patient preferences. Um, and it is really important, I try to show you with the middle part on what the data are where we make decisions on. So it's not just patient preference. It's she, we also need trial data, clinical outcomes that we can, can base our decisions on. But it's an important part of the puzzle. And then I come to my final part of this presentation where we really, when did I meet Prefer and Esther, was in the setting of scientific advice where you wanted to have the preferred methodology for patient preference elicitation and where to, and how to do that, uh, qualified and, and rubber stamp, let's say it, by the regulator from, okay, this is an approach how you can get and generate this kind of information. So that was the IMI Prefer project, and I think it's still, it's in the, the closing phases of fantastic work, lots of publications, and um, I think you uh, published this interesting graph on how you should define your your, your study questions, how you then perform that, and how you apply it uh, ultimately in the decision making. And I think that is really an important uh, part. I happen to be in the position also to be in, an opponent in, in Sweden, usually very long interaction with a, a PhD candidate, uh, sweating next to you. In this case, it was uh, virtually, and we were both sweating in front of the, the screen. And where she also really focused, a part of her work was on where to position the patient preferences. And I was a little disappointed that for the regulator, we, we only got in this middle part. And I had hoped we would be already being talking with them in the discovery phase. What kind of outcomes are needed, because it takes a while also to develop the right type of outcomes. What I was immensely impressed with her work was that, and I think that is also obviously one of your legacies, choosing the patient is not just the participant, uh, sorry, the, the guinea pig in the trials and in the, the studies, but they are also really involved in designing the research. And I think that is something that I was really impressed by, how this was taken throughout that uh, IMI Prefer project also. So I think um, um, almost last point is that this is where prefer comes with using the, the, the preference studies, where it is unclear what uh, the most important outcomes are. If you have multiple treatment options and you have to make choices in that, if there is a considerable uncertainty, all these aspects are possible to, to address. And indeed, that heterogeneity that I also explained between patients, but also the other stakeholders, uh, probably us as, as regulators and, and, and payers and, and decision makers, uh, very good, I think, very important information to help us. So, concluding, I think patient experience data are really becoming increasingly important in the regulatory decision making. 
Um, it is part of, obviously, any patient-centered assessment. Uh, the direct use, yes, not that many. Uh, Tanezumab, I think uh, a drug for osteoarthritis, there was a lot of discussion around that, but it, uh, around patient preference in that decision. But otherwise, it is not always so outspoken. Uh, and so I think we need to get and, and, and the, the generate more knowledge, more experience also with the approaches and where it actually fits. We have to be a little bit careful that it is also not only a, a method to um, help shaky drugs with poor benefit-risk balance to get on the market with just making it instead of having uh, uh, something that really brings in, okay, now we take these patient preferences in to very early already identify what are important outcomes for patients to be measured. So finally, as our experience is, is limited, I think it's also important that if you plan to do that, if a company plans to do this, that they come early and interact with the regulator, perhaps also HTA, on seeing what the method can bring. I think that was what I had wanted to say. Thanks for giving us this great insight into the regulator perspective. Are there questions in the audience? While you are thinking, oh, I see that Ellie Stolk raised her hand. Sorry? Okay. Can you help? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, yeah, Ellie Stolk, Yorko Research Foundation. Um, uh, my vraag gaat over die opmerking die je aan het eind maakte. Jij zegt we moeten toch wel voorkomen. Sorry, I have to switch to English. Yeah, yes, yes, please Sorry. in English because we have an uh, international audience online. I apologize for the English listeners and speakers in the room. Uh, I'm Ellie Stolk. I was intrigued by the last remark about uh, how to prevent that shaky drugs are entering the benefit package because of uh, patient preference data supporting the case. How can we do that? Because I've seen so many DCs technically sound, but you wonder about why they were done, uh, how many earlier attempts to provide a uh, favorable result for that drug have been uh, performed, but hidden, not even presented as a poster on the pa paper. I think we have far too little regulation about um, transparency of DCs and requiring that they're part of the process. I was wondering if you have views or perhaps somebody else in the audience. Yeah, so, so indeed, uh, we had a long discussion actually internally when we were discussing the, the qualification of, of prefer uh, uh, framework. Because indeed, um, it, it makes sense to have this kind of data, uh, not for every dossier, because uh, the, the, if we have always approved a drug based on cardiovascular outcomes or glucose lowering, there is not really a need to have specific discussion around the endpoints. But if it then only comes indeed, as, as we reflect on, on, on drugs where, where this, this you see terrible or, or difficult adverse effects and the efficacy is not that large, then you start thinking, okay, so they come now with this technique trying to find a patient group that says it, it works. So what I think um, um, what, what we could do is at least that you register your studies. I think there was a, a proposal also to have these studies always registered if you perform them. I think it would be good to consider as much as possible, okay, we need a study like this because this will be a disease where the outcomes are not immediately understood by a regulator because they don't have so much experience. And... Um, yeah, when you have then already in the program identified something like an, uh, an important adverse effect that is really yeah, maybe very rare but very important, maybe design a study like that early on and come to already regulate it. As, as I said, we have this scientific advice procedure and, and so come on and say, okay, well, we are going to design a study because we need to add this to our benefit-risk information for you to make your decision ultimately on. Als Dongers, go ahead. Yeah, um, you say we want to avoid that more drugs get on the market, but can you think of a situation where patient preferences would indeed prevent a drug from being approved? Yeah, well, that, and that, that is a little bit uh, a difficult setting because we as regulators um, usually work with the data that a company comes. They build a dossier, they come with that dossier and they try to get it approved. So... Um, usually uh, a study that they have to submit all the data that they have done. So if they would have done a patient preference study that comes out negative for that drug, they have to put that in the package. 
Um, but that's obviously a sort of rare scenario. The scenario you're probably alluding to would be where somebody else did a study, a patient preference study, and would suggest, hey, this is not a drug people like. Then you go to the ANA mostly. Uh, if, if the drug is very harmful, you can bring it together with a publication maybe on uh, the adverse event where we have to react on. That is what we do, the pharmacovigilance. The, the patient preferences could then support that kind of idea, okay, something is wrong, we could refer to that. But we don't normally set out these kind of studies ourselves then to look at this. We can do that for safety, but we don't, well, we haven't done that yet. And I don't foresee it immediately that we would ask for patient preferences all around should we keep the drug on the market. Having said that, I realized that we had this hearing on the uh, um, Valparate um, um, adverse effects that, that were uh, around uh, uh, teratogenicity of that drug. And we had a hearing where also lots of patients came into that discussion. So perhaps indeed, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just responding to your question immediately, uh, could be a setting where we could have asked for a patient preference study. And now you say it, it might be on my mind for the next time something like this happens. Peter, we heard a presentation by Diana from an HDA body perspective, um, advocating a, a stronger patient engagement, and, and, and you, from a regulator perspective, uh, said the same. Eh? You would like to involve patients more earlier on in the whole process. Are there any initiatives taken to join forces between the regulators and the HDA bodies to engage patients? Because uh, in the end, you're looking at the same type of evidence mm -hmm. and, uh, well, you're doing the same type of, of scoping uh, pre pre uh, to start with the whole process. Yeah. Uh, so there are absolutely initiatives in the sense that we try to, to structure that patient input. We do have, for instance, the prefer uh, qualification was done collaboratively with UNETA. The regulators obviously collaborate much more at the European level, so it's always a little easier for us to work at this European level trying to get things done with industry or academic groups than obviously always having uh, than, than the HTAs are, are being organised. But yes, also in the Netherlands we have this project where we do a bit of a collaborative kind of assessment. Early on, HTAs look, uh, the ZIN looks along our assessments. And um, yeah, we definitely take patients on board, and I, I believe you do that as well. So uh, the answer is actually yes, but it, it's, it's going slower. In, uh, yeah, but you're still talking to different groups of patients, if I hear you. Sometimes answer. yes, but, but like in the address where patients are being trained to interact with us, because we, we speak do strange language, not just the English. And what I've, I've noticed when we moved from the UK to the Netherlands, you already saw that it's for patients a little bit of a higher hurdle to get involved in processes because of the language, mm -hmm. but it's also the, the jargon that we obviously yeah, all of us use. Imagine. Yeah, I think there's a question online, right? Uh, no. no. Okay, you have a question <laughs> yourself. Yeah. Vivian Rekkers. Um, yeah, thank you. So I was just wondering because uh, I can understand that some patient groups are more capable or able to or willing to participate in uh, drug developing or thinking along or thinking about uh, endpoints to use in studies. but wouldn't you worry about inequality in access or differences in uh, the evidence used? So I can imagine that if you use patient information on relevant endpoints in some patient groups but not in others, that there may be inequalities in or uh, some drugs may not be as effective as other drugs but simply because you use different information. So what are the thoughts on this? Yeah, so so I, I, I absolutely agree. I think the heterogeneity is not just in, in within groups, it's also outside the groups that you haven't studied. Um, yeah, in the end, we will never have a complete picture. As, as I always like to show that picture, we have these data at time of an approval where we get the drug to the market. Um, we can get more data, uh, or the exposure becomes bigger afterwards. But also that other figure that I showed from Hans-Georg Eichler, where you see if you generate all this kind of information and all answer all the questions you ask, at some point we reach an optimum on when you approve a drug. So what can we generate in the context of, or at the time of an approval, at the time of a decision on, on, on reimbursement, and what do we generate afterwards? I think also real-world evidence, understanding what happens with drugs in clinical practice, uh, filling in the gaps that we have sort of assumed that it would work the drug as similarly as in the, the population studied. Equally, I think these kind of 
data generated by, by academics could help influence the further uptake. It's also the guidelines that work there. And yes, I, holistically, it would be fantastic if we could combine all these knowledge. But yeah, you have also to be balancing a little bit on how much you want to do before you approve the drug. Otherwise, it's now a billion or something for a new drug. And then it becomes two billion. But maybe Maureen, you know that better than I. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for answering uh, these questions, um, Peter. Um, on our schedule, there's now time for a short coffee break, and we will continue again five minutes before two o'clock. And Peter, there's a present for you as well. Thank you.
Welcome back. We uh, continue our uh, symposium with a presentation by uh, Dr. Jorin uh, Feldweg, who is uh, uh, assistant professor as, uh, at the Erasmus School of Health Policy and Management. And she's going to tell us much more about different preference elicitation methods. For Jorin. Um, thank you. Maureen, and thank you, Esther. And I would like to start with thanking a, a lot of other people, actually. Uh, all the people that have contributed to the work that I will be presenting today, and especially also Karin Aushorn, who is here today, uh, and the Prefer Project. But uh, let's start at the beginning. Um, throughout the development of drugs and devices, what we call the medical product life cycle, and it's shown on the top in the white uh, not so clear chevrons on the slide. Um, patients are involved in some kind of capacity and we've uh, already learned that. Uh, there are three groups of decision makers and uh, those decision makers make um, decisions in this medical product life cycle. Critical decisions, what we call, um, and with that I mean go, no, go decisions on the further development of drugs and devices and the authorization of those uh, drugs and devices. And these three groups of decision makers are representatives from industry, uh, but also from regulatory and HTA agencies. So patients are involved in some kind of capacity because all decision makers and stakeholders think that that is important. And of course, we are very happy that they think that that is important. 
Um, we've also heard that it's usually only one or two patients or a very small group of patients that are asked to represent the entire patient population and to express their perspectives. Now, if we ask ourselves if one or two patients actually are representative of an entire patient population, I think we can immediately conclude that that likely is not the case. So how do we measure preferences of an entire patient population? Well, of course, we could just observe the choices that they make in real life. However, to draw valid conclusions based on such observations, we would need a very large sample size. And given the time and budget constraints that we generally have, uh, that would not be very feasible. Um, also, for drugs that are not on the market yet, such observations, of course, are not possible. Or when there's no comparator on the market, it also doesn't make a lot of sense. So, in those cases, we need to move to hypothetical situations. Um, in the past, we've done that a lot with Likert surveys. And those Likert skill surveys have a very high internal consistency, usually. But if I ask a random patient or anyone maybe in this room, uh, how important the four items on this list are when you have to decide on a new treatment, I think most of you will say that all of them are very important. And I think that's completely understandable and probably also true. However, we do not learn so much from this exercise, because now we do not know how much money people are willing to spend on a treatment with a uh, much lower waiting time or how much risk for side effects people are willing to take for a treatment that's much more effective. So we want to move to pairwise comparisons. So we want to quantify the relative importance of treatment characteristics, and that is what we call preferences. A recent review has identified 23 preference elicitation methods and grouped them into four groups. First are the rating-related techniques. There we ask respondents to rank order characteristics of drugs from most to least important. Then there's rating-related techniques, where we, besides the rank order, also ask them to distribute points, so that we know something about the relative importance of the characteristics to each, relative to each other then. Then there's threshold-related techniques, those are techniques in which we could, for instance, present a patient with the current um, standard of care or treatment, and then a new treatment with increased risk, and then we start to increase the benefit of the new treatment until patients switch from their current to the new treatment. And then finally are the discrete choice-based related techniques where we show patients full treatment profiles and have them select among those profiles. For some of these methods, there's evidence-based guidelines. For others, there is not. There are several ISPOR task forces, but we, of course, also have our Erasmus Choice Modeling Center and the International Academy of Health Preference Research. But there's also several very specific projects, such as the PREFER project, which was already introduced by uh, Peter, and uh, some projects internally here in Rotterdam, such as the Smarter Choice for Better Health. And all of these initiatives try to contribute to the methodological advancements of these methods and to steer towards accurate conduct of the methods and towards evidence-based guidelines. Another important question, of course, is what method to use when? And uh, to start to answer this question, a previous study in, uh, as part of PREFER has appraised all of the methods that I presented to you on the previous slide. And they did so using a very structured approach. They started with a literature review, then they did an AHP and a Q methodology to first determine and find relevant cr criteria to describe methods, and then to restrict that list uh, to the 19 most important methods criteria. Um, what they also did is build a performance matrix based on expert interviews and a literature study, and that said it was a binary uh, value function, so it is an overview of for all the methods, whether they either comply or do not comply with each of those 19 criteria. And then, of course, what they concluded, uh, 
is um, something on the appraisal of the methods, and it resulted in the fact that 10 methods were marked as promising methods for preference solicitation, of which we used five in the prefer project. Please don't read everything that is on the slide. I just want to show you uh, what a performance matrix looks like. And the performance matrix has um, 12 operational aspects, and those are expert um, uh, criteria that relate to, for instance, the cost of a study, the duration of the study, sample size that is required for a study, and so on. And then we had seven outcome-related criteria, and those relate to the outcomes that you can calculate based on a certain method, but also things related to internal and external validity. Well, based on that matrix that was created, we've conducted a multi-criteria decision analysis. Because we wanted to know the relative importance of those 19 criteria according to the decision makers in the medical product lifecycle for when they want to conduct or evaluate a patient preference study as part of their decision-making process. So for that effort, we've drafted a survey and we distributed it among these uh, decision makers. Uh, and we asked them, to rank the top 10 criteria of these 19 criteria in total. And for that top 10, we've also asked them to distribute points um, in, to show the relative importance of these, this top 10 criteria um, according to themselves for their own decision-making points. Well, based on that, of course, we could calculate the value of each criterion and as soon as you know the value of each criterion and you, compare, uh, you combine that with the performance matrix, you can calculate the total value or the total score of each method. And we did so for five commonly used preference solicitation methods, and those are the discrete choice experiment, swing weighting, the probabilistic threshold technique, and best for scaling case one and case two. So this is part of the results. Um, and these are related to the operational criteria that I just showed you. And I put a threshold at 8 because we considered all criteria that scored higher than 8, in this case, to be top-weighted criteria. And what we see, for instance, is that uh, study duration is a top-weighted criteria. It phase 3 clinical trials. Uh, we see um, that public acknowledgement for a method is really important for HTA decision making. And uh, the low cost of a study is particularly important very early in the medical product life cycle. And I think that that also makes a lot of sense. On this slide, we see the results related to the outcome criteria. Uh, again, I put the threshold at 8, but the x-axis is slightly rescaled. What we immediately see is that actually all these outcomes are more important than the operational aspects. Quantifying heterogeneity, oh, previous. Uh, quantifying heterogeneity is mostly important um, in the late phases of uh, the medical product life cycle. Um, <clears throat> The exploring reasons behind preferences in qualitative detail is uh, mainly important very early in industry decisions and in HCA decision making. Well, I would say obviously estimating weights and trade-offs between characteristics is according uh, to uh, is important according to all decision makers at all of the decision points. And then finally, external validity of a method mainly is important at the end stages of industry decision-making and for regulators. So now we know that, we can calculate the score of each of those five methods that I was talking about. And what we see here is that the probabilistic threshold technique and swing weighting score highest uh, across all the decision points according to these decision maker makers. And the DCE scores highest um, for late industry decision-making. We did a lot of sensitivity analysis <laughs> because the performance matrix and how it was completed, uh, there are several uncertainties. Uh, on the left side in A, you see the original scoring of the methods. And in D, you see what happens if we 
in contrast to the uh, initial performance matrix, say that best for scaling case two and DCE um, actually have choice tasks that are low in their cognitive burden to participants. And we made this change because the case studies in PREFER showed, and also studies outside of PREFER, by the way, show that uh, participants report that choice tasks, particularly also in a DCE, are easy or very easy to answer. Uh, but we see an increase in the scoring of these two methods, of course. Now, if we uh, acknowledge for the fact that, uh, for DCE at least, there's some evidence on external validity, as we know from studies uh, from Esther, we see quite a steep increase into the scoring of this method. So I guess what I would want to conclude here is that not all methods criteria were equally important at each of the decisions in the medical product life cycle. And the use of the performance matrix heavily impacted the scoring or the value of the methods. And due to the um, ongoing advancements in uh, the field of preference methods, I think it's uh, ha uh, related to the experimental designs or to the analysis, I think it's very important that we continue to update these performance matrices based on the empirical evidence that we gather. What we also might want to do is to use a less strict value function in a performance matrix. Like I said, now we used uh, one that was binary, so a method either complied to the criterion or it didn't. But for some criteria, like uh, the external validity, for instance, you might want to use a partial value function. And you might also want to do that for whether or not a method is able to um, identify preference heterogeneity. Because in the current matrix, we assumed that all methods could do so. And of course, you can always run subgroup analysis on the data generated by any of the methods, but only some methods allow to investigate preference heterogeneity even within the subgroups that we found due to more advanced modeling techniques such as mixed logit models or latent class analysis. So, historically, DCE has been used most often to elicit preferences. But I would say that we should also consider best for scaling, swing weighting, and probabilistic threshold technique um, to address the needs of decision makers in the medical product life so cycle when they would want to include preferences in their decision making process. So now we compared characteristics of uh, methods, but how do the outcomes of these methods actually compare? Well, we did several studies in the PREFER project in which we compared DCE to other methods, and those were swing weighting, best for scaling, and threshold uh, technique again, when we compared their main outcome measures. But before I show you the outcomes of this study, I would like to show you um, what we actually ask of patients or participants when they complete the choice task of these methods. And here you see one of the choice tasks uh, of a DCE that was conducted. You see treatment A, B and no treatment, and those treatments are described by the same attributes on the left, only the levels of those attributes differ within the treatments and between the treatments, and patients were asked to complete multiple of these choices. In the same study, we asked participants to complete a probabilistic threshold technique. There they had to choose between a treatment and no treatment. And in this case, if participants chose the treatment, we increased the level of mild side effect until they switched to the no treatment alternative and vice versa. And we did so for all of the risks that we had included in this project. Here is an example of a swing weighting experiment. On the left, you see different attributes and the switch of uh, each attribute from the worst level to the best level. So if we look at survival, the lowest chance of survival to the highest, uh, complete hair loss to no hair loss. And we ask, first of all, patients to rank order these uh, switches in attribute levels from most to least important. And after that, we ask them to assign points or distribute points to reflect the relative importance of each of these switches or what we call swings. And finally, here's an example of a best for scaling, and in this case, a best for scaling case two, where we see 
different attributes and their levels, and we ask patients or participants now from this list of attribute levels, please pick your best and your worst. Okay, results. First of all, let's look at the ranking of the attributes. The ranking or, um, of the attributes was somewhat similar, or at least uh, the most important ones were the most important ones ac according to both methods, and in some cases that also accounted for the least important ones. But particularly in the middle and towards the tail, we also saw quite a, a widespread in the attribute rankings. If we move to the weights that were calculated for the attributes, we see a striking difference with the DCE always having a much wider range in attribute weight compared to the other methods with the largest difference between DCE and swing weighting. And um, it might be the case that the other methods allow respondents to put equal weights on, or at least more equal weights, on the different attributes and their levels than a DCE in which they were maybe forced more to trade. We also calculated the correlation between the outcomes. <clears throat> and for th in three of the four cases, we saw moderate to high correlation between the outcomes that were generated, with comparing DCE and probabilistic threshold techniques showing even a correlation coefficient of over 0.8. So, we found differences in methods and the outcomes in methods. And those differences were more profound when we looked at the attribute weights than when we looked at the attribute rankings. And that in part might be due to the underlying structure of the methods because already the choice tasks that people complete are quite different across methods as you just had seen. But also there's different biases that play a role when applying each of these methods. And I think also very important is that for some methods, um, the outcome that we compared was a primary outcome measure and for others that was a secondary. For instance, the maximum acceptable risk that we calculated was a primary outcome for the probabilistic threshold technique, but a secondary outcome for a DCE study. And of course, that might also impact results. Most importantly, I think, is that there's not a method that we have as a golden standard. We have no one method that we can compare everything to, and we do not know true preferences. So, we need further studies. We need further studies comparing methods. The methods that we had compared, but also other methods and comparisons. We need more insight into the internal validity of these methods and into the quality of the data that these methods generate, but also the external validity and the extent to which uh, the outcomes of one study in one particular situation are transferable to another situation. Also, when we make decisions in the medical product life cycle, it's really important that we understand how participants trade and uh, evaluate the benefits and risks that we have uh, included. However, there's no evidence-based guidance on how to include, choose, present, and model risks and benefits that we include in DCEs. And from the economic models, the impact that risks and benefits have on utility focuses only on the trade-offs that people make. However, instead of assuming that respondents evaluate all alternatives in the choice task and weigh all attrib attributes and levels against each other in each of those alternatives, it might be that simplifying heuristics play a role. And besides the well-known attribute non-attendance and dominant decision-making behavior, it might be that if we include risks in our DCE, or not enough benefit, I would say, in a DCE, that people eliminate complete alternatives from their choice. And that is called choice set formation. And this suggests a two-stage process, where first, respondents uh, look at the levels of particular attributes to see if they find an alternative in a choice task um, good enough to be included in their decision. 
And mm -hmm. then is a second stage of called choice, where they actually weigh all the attributes and levels and make trade-offs, but only for the alternatives for which they have decided that it should be included in the choice task. So it could be that if we include alternatives with a too high risk or too low benefit, that th that full alternative is eliminated. And if we do not account for that in our modeling strategies, we get biased estimates. And we get a misestimation of the DC outcomes, and particularly willingness to pay and uh, maximum acceptable risk levels. And of course, that impacts uh, the validity of the method and also the trust that we have in the method. So in a project, we had uh, re-analyzed data from four DCE studies that were previously conducted. And what we see is that the model fit of this choice set formation model is preferred over that of a utility only or a screening only model. And then I not only refer to the BIC, but also AIC, log likelihood, and pseudo R square. What we see in this picture is um, the probability of an alternative within a choice task to survive the triage stage and to be included then in the choice of people uh, for the three um, DCEs in which we actually found a screening behavior. And what we see is that with increasing effectiveness on the x-axis, the um, likelihood of an alternative to be included in a choice task increases. And we also see that here, between these two, is that uh, cost and between these two side effects impact the overall likelihood of survival of alternatives in a choice task. So where do we go now? Well, first of all, I think that there's an absolute and uh, critical need for further guidance on how to accurately conduct patient preference studies, uh, also for other methods than only DCE. Uh, we need to focus uh, our research also around internal and external validity of uh, all these different methods. And more uh, studies are needed into framing presentation and modeling of benefits and risks in such studies. I think PREFER is making an important first step in writing impactful and evidence-based guidelines uh, on the, a framework of how to, to elicit preferences and how to select suitable methods. And I think that also, of course, the Erasmus Choice Modeling Center, the ISPOR task forces, uh, but also the International Academy of Health Preference Research con will continue to contribute um, to these initiatives. And um, let me end by saying that I sincerely hope that these are the first steps into very many uh, steps uh, to further incorporate preferences of patients in decision making about drugs, devices and treatments of these patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorin, for this very nice uh, elaborate overview of the different uh, methods. Uh, questions from the audience? While you are thinking, I can maybe kick off with the first question. You, you often refer to, uh, we need to know more about internal and external uh, validity. It, can you tell us a little bit more about what we currently know about the external validity of discrete choice experiments? Because uh, the evidence is quite mixed and also seems to be very context dependent, right? Well, I, I uh, don't fully agree. <laughs> I think it's not so mixed. I think we see quite a good um, uh, external validity, or at least that's my interpretation. Um, we see uh, high uh, positive predictive values of, first of all, when we compare choices that they make to new choices in the survey, but also if we compare uh, what we did with Esther, what people say in a survey and what they do in real life. And you can do that in different ways, of course. You can recreate uh, the choice of real life in one single choice task and based on that one choice see what they do in real life or based on uh, uh, what we normally do in a DCE, multiple choices and then make a utility model and uh, predict what people will do in real life. And also in those cases we see very high uh, overlap in what people say they do and what they actually do in real life. 
Yeah, I, I saw uh, indeed studies uh, from, from Esther that showed very good external validity in the context of screening and vaccination. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but when we did the DCE of the co Corona contact tracing app, uh, we find out that the external validity was 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 not as good as, as Esther found before in her studies. And I see no, Esther I wants to comment on this as well. So uh, I give you, in the meantime, the floor. Well, thank you so much. So I have to say, indeed, the external validity in my study, what I found, was really high on an aggregate level and also on an individual level. And that was indeed for colorectal cancer screening and, and vaccination. However, I also have studies where it was not so successful, and, and I will also talk about that in my inaugural lecture, why that is the case. So I have to say, yes, it can be very promising, but indeed it is context specific. And I can say that definitely the choice models we have right now are not always sufficient for, in that case, the external validity, at least in healthcare. Yeah. You want to comment uh, a bit more on this, uh, Jorin? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, obviously, Esther is here, uh, the expert on this topic. I think that just that, uh, especially the DC that you were referring to, the time that we did that, it was very unclear, the situation was unclear, the vaccine was unclear, the app was unclear, there was so much uh, hypothetical information included that, of course, that alludes to the uh, possibility that you do not... Um, estimate things and predict things well, because when we did the study and when we uh, then compared it to the outcome, a lot had changed already. So, I mean, context, of course, needs to stay similar. Yeah, Other questions? Uh, Ewart. Yeah, thanks. Now, maybe to broaden the, this point of, uh, say, external validity and, and yeah, the, 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 I was triggered by what you mentioned, Jorin, on a cognitive burden. And also you came back to this issue of presentation and for specifically about risks. And when I see the examples that you showed that it's, it's really, uh, I would say it's cognitively quite demanding, any of these choice tasks. So and one of the things that we found in, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, so Esther, uh, was that, that some things that uh, sound simple to some people sound difficult to especially higher educated people. Yeah. We, we found, for example, the claim unnecessary surgery that lower educated people found it easy, that you don't want that, while the higher educated found that very difficult. So I'm wondering what kind of research ca can help us there to, to make this better? I mean, I saw just simple percentages now. Is that a way to go to clarify that? Or? No, not just uh, simple percentages, I would say. You're in the examples, 60%, percent Yeah, I know. I know, but we, uh, in that case, may I should clarify that we had uh, very nice uh, pop-ups. So when you hovered with your mouse over the choice task, you saw not only the percentage, but you also saw when the percentage was 20, like 20 out of 100 people uh, will get this, and that means that 80 out of 100 will not. Um, and then specific to that uh, risk that was presented, we also included an icon array. And usually, if you include those three at the same time, uh, you help all kinds of people, the ones that are more graphically oriented and the ones that are more numbers oriented. Um, I like what you were saying. Um, they all look quite complex. Well, they all also look quite complex to me. But if we say that some methods are low in their burden, then it's not, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, fair to say that other methods are uh, much higher in their cognitive burden. So I would put them at the same level at least. Um, and I think also we sometimes underestimate what people can do. Every time I show a DCE choice test for the first time to someone, they say, oh no, 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 I don't want this in my survey, it's too complex. And then when you have people complete it, the, the data looks quite good, they are perfectly capable of doing it. And I think also what is important, if, if a task is hard, it doesn't mean that you cannot do it. If it's more complex than saying how old you are or if you're male or female and what's your educational level, um, I mean, obviously, these tasks are more complex, but it doesn't mean that people will do them wrong. Thanks. Other questions from the audience? Yes. Well, I had hoped uh, Jorin would throw me the, the thingy, but... <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I don't <laughs> we think were you were hoping before. for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jorin, I, I want to catch on from that, that cognitive, because I was first a little surprised that DCE came out as, as, as the, the easiest task. Uh, but, but then I also saw that uh, 
in, in uh, when Karin Schölin did this, at least the, the example in rheumatoid arthritis, she repeated it with a different way of presenting the, the case. So, and you now also indicated that, that when you hover over the text that, that something pops up. So how much is that presentation affecting how people respond to these questionnaires? Because she saw a bit of a different response, more emphasis on, on harm of the drug than, than in the earlier survey that was having a more simple presentation of the material. Yeah, and I think that that's, of course, how, how choice task look um, will have impacted the results, I think, heavily. And uh, um, I, I'm not too sure if it impacts how complex it is, uh, because I think the two were quite comparable. And I also must say that um, due to the fact that we have, that DCE has been conducted historically most often, that also means that we have most experience with building DCE surveys and we have tested them. So we know, well, not everything, but we know now quite well, in, at least in some instances, what works and what doesn't. Um, and we have a good way of building those surveys with qualitative research and pre-testing and pilot testing, all those stages to ensure that we uh, do as best as we can. And um, we don't have that yet for uh, all the other methods. And that's also why I think that we need to draft those guidelines. I see a question from Ali Stolk. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you're drafting guidelines uh, about methods, whether you also have an idea of um, when you have achieved a sufficiently high level of uh, maturation in a method to really recommend it. And I think that with all the rapid um, evolution still taking place in DC, that we're perhaps making fast progress towards that goal but as, f as far as i know the goal of what is it actually what makes a mature method what's the definition of a mature method i think that's not uh, well defined and this creates confusion among users about the status of these methods yeah absolutely and then um then you, of course, also have the differences between disciplines. I mean, DCEs obviously are not only conducted in health, but also in, uh, in other areas of uh, the academic sphere. And there things are a little bit different again. Um, I don't know if it is important to say this is the moment where we know enough. Now everybody should use this design and this analysis method. I think it's fine if we draft general um, steps that we think are necessary to make a currently good practice DCE. And those guidelines are there for DCE, and I think they're already quite old, but those steps still apply, even though the actual uh, methods that we use for the analysis have evolved over time. And uh, for a lot of other um, uh, methods, that doesn't even exist. So. Uh, what we also did in Prefer, for instance, is that we first designed the DCE because we had a good idea of how to do that. And then based on how we designed our DCE, we made the other method as good as possible. But there's less guidance on how, what steps to take um, for these methods. Do I need to do ah, I, I agree with you. Um, Methods evolve continuously, that is inherent to science, and uh, your aim now should be to do study state of the art. And later on, you might look back at your own work and think, okay, with the knowledge that, now I, ha that I now have, I could have done it better. Yeah. Um, but in this context, you're comparing methods. And I don't know, among the 27 methods or whatever you compared, uh, what level of maturity each of them has reached in its own mm -hmm. right. And if you're considering to replace one method with another method, that level is, of maturity is going to be very important to yep. understand how stable results will be. Yeah. So I think, first of all, it's really important that I would not say that we should all use one method for everything. 
I think we need to decide on methods based on a lot, not only the characteristic of the method, but also the research question that you have, the audience that needs to complete it. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that um, help you uh, select a method. Um, and, and you're completely right. Not all methods have, have guidance on how they should be conducted. So um, I think it's, in that sense, maybe also not a... Um, a super fair comparison. We did our best in developing all of these methods in the best we could, based on the knowledge that currently exists on how to best do it. Uh, but there's just more evidence for some than there is for others. Well, thank you very much, Yurin, for your presentation and answering these not so easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on with the presentation by Professor Dr. Rey. Uh, Kaspar Gores from the Technical University of Delft, and he's going to present about self-interest, positional concerns, and distributional considerations in healthcare preferences. Kaspar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maureen. And before I start doing that, let me also congratulate Esther, congratulate you. Um, well, we've been knowing each other for quite a while, and it's always a pleasure to collaborate, right? Whether it's a co-authorship of a paper in Pharmacoeconomics 2013, or whether it's supervising Nicolas Smele, a joint PhD student that we have. It's always a pleasure. It's really nice to see you now promoted to full professor, well-deserved and the star of the show today. So thanks for letting me be a part of that. Um, I'll indeed uh, talk about healthcare preferences. And as some of you in the audience know, I'm not a healthcare person, I'm a preference person. So that also is the biggest disclaimer that I want to make. Um, you can criticize me all that you want about stupid things that I say about health and about healthcare. I will try to deflect some of that to one of my co-authors in the room, Job van Exel. Thanks for being here as a radar deflection shield. Um, Emro uh, Daniel is not in the room. He's in Sweden, where he currently works, but he did most of the work, actually, as a postdoc in my um, ERC program, thanks to the, to the funding agency. And together, the three of us um, did this study, um, which I think indeed relates quite nicely to, uh, to the topic of today. Now, when you support or oppose some healthcare policy as a citizen, or perhaps even as a patient, being also, of course, a citizen, and there can be various reasons for doing so, right? Um, the obvious ones is that you want to take care of yourself, right? You can oppose or agree with a policy if you think, well, it's good for me. Um, traditionally, of course, that's the main focus point of healthcare preference research, people acting from their homo economicus, preferences, what is in it for me. While very important, we see also other motivations, motivational dimensions popping into the, into the picture of healthcare preferences, and not just in healthcare, by the way, throughout um, economic sciences, I would say, or social sciences more generally. We see a lot of talk increasingly about positional preferences. People can enjoy just having a bit more than others. People can also hate it to have a little bit less than others. Having your, seeing your neighbor buying a bigger car than you have kind of makes you a little bit less happy with your own car and than you would have otherwise been. Well, that's of probably the human in its poorest form, but we are humans, including these things. Um, probably more kind of hopeful is that people are known to care about distributions as well, irrespective of how they fare. People don't like unfairness in society. They don't want a couple of people having a lot and the rest of the world having nothing, irrespective of who of those persons you would be. That's called the vile of ignorance, right? So if you don't know where you would be on the distribution, you still care about the distribution. In healthcare, um, the large majority of studies is either focused on people's self-interest or on people's um, preferences for distributions of healthcare and fairness in society. The other one, positional concerns, has been studied much less so. Luckily, there are a couple of studies, one of them by Job van Exel and his co-authors, um, but still a lot of room for further research there. Now, what do we try to do in this study? 
we try to study those three factors, those three motivations, jointly. Um, that already, to me, as a methodologist, sounds very exciting. Um, it's also tough to do. I'll explain it in a moment why it is so difficult. Well, not in a moment, it's actually on this slide. Um, why is it difficult? Because they are confounded, they are related. Right? If I get a bigger car, it also means that the size of my car relative to my neighbors also increases. It also, in a way, means that there is one more big car in the Netherlands. So it even affects the distribution of cars in the Netherlands. In healthcare, if I get a better treatment, that means my position relative to others in terms of the treatment they get might change. It also says something about changes in the distribution. So disentangling all these motivations is very tricky, econometrically speaking, and in terms of the experiments that you try to make to get those motivations. Now, what is the context we're looking at? Um, medical treatment, and we're talking about waiting times. So we're literally talking about a queue and a distribution of waiting times. There is some medical problem, there's a treatment, and some people will have to wait longer than others, be it by chance or by some other factor, for example, uh, older people getting earlier access to vaccines in the COVID uh, context, etc. We also studied differences in culture or geography, UK versus the USA, in some aspects, very similar countries, in other aspects, like healthcare, very different. And we look at a particular form of self-interest, uh, which is not just focusing on you, but on local altruism. So your loved one, your spouse, your child, your brother, sister, best friend, something like someone like that. And we try to see if the relative importance of uh, distributional concerns, selfish concerns, positional concerns varies across cultures, across whether or not people talk about themselves or about their spouse. Okay? So that's what we aim to do, and we tried to, um, to develop a choice experiment here. So what we did, we asked people um, to imagine a certain situation where there would be a, an unspecified disease, or at least unspecified in terms of its molecular base or its virus base or whatever, but it was specified in terms of the effect it would have on you. And we used a skill that for me as a choice modeler sounds like a, uh, something out of a magician's box, but I think for many of you it triggers some recollection, Eurocall, e EQ, etc. Um, which studies, of course, how people rate themselves in terms of their ability to do things. Um, and we were able to kind of contextually, of course, without giving um, this number to people, but we asked, we asked them to think about the situation where there would be a disease that would deteriorate their health in certain dimensions, for example, their ability to do work, etc. We also told people that there was this committee of experts that had to decide about waiting times because there was a scarcity issue and we couldn't help everyone at the same time in a matter of days. Now, we tried to create several experimental conditions and at the same time, several sample stratifications. Okay, trying um, or starting with experimental conditions, we made people uh, we force them or ask them to make choices from behind the vial of ignorance. So basically presenting people um, with the distribution of waiting times and then asking them, well, which one of you, which one would you prefer? And we also ask them the same question, but then pinpointing their own position on this histogram, saying, well, this is the distribution of waiting times and here's your place. I'll show you later on what it looks like. So that is uh, two experimental conditions, and we varied, so we asked, we basically split the sample, half of them were to ask these questions for themselves, to answer them for themselves. The other half was asked to basically uh, answer these questions for their loved one. And also, um, we tried to uh, and we succeeded because it's not that difficult. We sampled in the USA and in the UK. Okay, so we had like 750 respondents, each making 20 choices 
in each of these experimental cells. Now, the experimental design was quite difficult. As I told you already, if you want to create choice situations where you want to disentangle distributional effects from positional effects, from self-interest, you need to do so very carefully to avoid confounding of all these factors. Amro, the gentleman in the top right corner, uh, worked very hard and diligently on that difficult task, which should be acknowledged. Now, this is typically a file of ignorance situation where we show a histogram. Um, the light blue uh, does show a little bit lighter here than anticipated, but you can probably see here that people were asked to choose between plan A and plan B. Um, where plan A, most people had a super short waiting time of three weeks, and there were some people with a higher waiting time, and we have task or plan B, where many people had a much longer waiting time of 12 weeks. That's a histogram, right? Classical histogram. Then a couple of choice tasks later, people would see the same task, but now with their own position in red. So we here see that in task B, the individual would face a waiting time of six weeks in plan A, and a waiting time of nine weeks in plan B. If that person would nonetheless choose plan B on the right-hand graph, that would signal that the individual is willing to wait a little bit longer in order to be earlier in the queue, right? Because here there's many people after the person, and in plan A, almost everyone is before, okay? So people, we try to flesh out whether people would do these kind of things and more generally, which distribution they would like if they would not know where they are. Um, I'm thinking if I was going to make a claim about choice experiments being the gold standard and kind of having a little debate with Jorin, but perhaps at the end of the presentation or during the debate or during the Q&A, we'll have time for that. It's a very interesting topic in itself, of course. Uh, but let's move to results and descriptives um, for now, starting with some relatively um, aggregate statistics, then I'll move into choice modeling results, no equations, just outcomes. If you want to know the methodology behind it, we have the paper uh, ready for submission. I'm happy to send it to you. Um, so what we first check, we just looked at the choices people made, no model estimations, and we tried to see how many of those choices would be in line with a certain motivation. So a choice could be in line with a uh, positional preference, for example, if someone uh, was willing to give up some waiting time in order to jump a little bit in the queue. A summary of this, but please read this with a grain of salt, because some of these factors are now actually confounded, and we'll try to disentangle them later on in the research. But what we saw when we kind of superficially looked at things is that each motive aligns um, with more than half of the choices, kind of giving a first idea of people taking all these three things into account, self-interest, positional preferences, distributional considerations. Across countries, and whether or not you think about yourself or whether you were asked to fill out the choice tasks for your spouse, loved one, etc. We did notice that self-interest appeared to be the dominant concern in the USA, while distributional considerations were um, considered more importantly in the UK. Um, positionality, seemingly more important in the USA than in the UK, um, etc. And in the USA, we did find a distinction between the fact that the socially exclusive group, so you thinking about someone else, your spouse, uh, then we saw that self-interest and distributional became more important than positional, right? So you care less about your partner's place in the queue relative to your partner's waiting time per se, or the distribution of waiting times for people's partners. Okay. Um, model estimations then, and again, um, no equations here, just outcomes. Uh, we estimated a series of um, choice models, and we started with the comparing the choices that were made on the exact same choice task, which were kind of randomized throughout the experiment, 
where first people made a choice from behind the file of ignorance, so they wouldn't know what their personal waiting time was, and then the exact same situation where we highlighted in red their actual waiting time. What we saw is that obviously in the first part it was only distributional concerns that mattered. I'll talk later on how we, me how we measured distributional concerns, but for now we'll take that for uh, granted for a moment. So of course if you don't know where you are on the distribution, you cannot think about anything else than do I like this distribution. When we do present your own spot in the distribution, we of course knew that people were going to consider their own waiting time, right? We're, we're not that kind um, as humans. But what we um, wanted to see is whether the distributional preferences would still play a role. And they did. Okay, perhaps non surprisingly, but at least a nice uh, starting point. And it was also nice to see that distributional preferences remained important in both countries and whether or not it would be you or your spouse um, being considered. Okay, now I've been talking, as I said, about distributional concerns uh, quite a bit without specifying really how we measure them. Now, when you look at a distribution, for example, on this slide, you see this histogram. How do you summarize a histogram? You can learn it in statistics, but that's something different, of course, from how people summarize or judge distributions. Uh, we used a couple of metrics that have been used in the fairness literature and equity literature in economics more generally, and also some applications in health, by the way. Uh, the minimax, quite well known, right? So you should, um, well, you should, this measure says that people uh, consider the worst off in the population and try to maximize their benefits, right? Which in this case is you try to minimize the maximum waiting time. Okay, there's various ways to argue why this is a good way of measuring things. For example, by, telling, by suggesting that people think it could just be me, that poor person having to wait 20 weeks. So that's one. The other is Shannon's entropy, which basically is a measure of inequity, right? If entropy is high, um, there's a widespread. If entropy is low, everyone has the same waiting time. Quite a natural me measure as well. We use the generalized entropy measure as well, which kind of tunes whether or not people focus on the left-hand side of the, or the right-hand side of this distribution. Um, and the easiest, most appealing one probably Expected value is the mean waiting time higher or lower in one of the plans. Summary, two bullets only. Expected value was robustly the best one in explaining choices. Okay, so people tend to kind of somehow, or although they of course did not compute any expectation, but they somehow were sensitive to the expected waiting time in these plans, whether or not they lived in the UK or the US and whether or not it was about their spouse or themselves. A bit more subtle is how do you measure positionality? And specifically, and this was one of those, actually this was the idea that started the paper, and in the end the paper became quite something different, but the, this little idea was, um, yeah, was typically some methodological thought that we liked, um, and that's actually, we know loss aversion, uh, the fact that losses loom larger than gains of equal size. And we thought something similar might be the case when people find themselves in a queue. And we call it, I think we call it jealousy aversion. Yeah. So when you are in a queue, imagine yourself um, in the Albert Heijn. You see people in front of you, you see people behind you. Then having someone added to the line in front of you, a noise, having people kind of being added to the queue behind you can make you happy in a way that you're kind of like, you know, I'm not the last one. I had this experience once where I entered a McDonald's, entered a huge queue, and when it was my turn, there was no one behind me. It made me feel ridiculous. It's like the worst timing you can have then to enter a restaurant, right? Okay, with Kind of medical waiting times, it's a bit similar, right? 
And we're not talking about people jumping the queue or whatever. It's not really that notion, but the notion of when people find themselves in a queue, a distribution, do the people being served earlier than them annoy them more than that the people behind them make them happy in a sense of not being one of those poor people? So we check that using a nice uh, formulation to see if that indeed plays a role. Long story short, no. Should I have skipped this slide? Perhaps. Um, but it's indeed, I think, interesting to know that this kind of uh, loss aversion or jealousy aversion did not play a role in positional preferences. Now, then the holy grail of this whole study, which it in the end became, is to see what is the relative importance of all these three factors. And our data allowed us to flesh it out. So what do we find? All motives matter. It's actually interesting because traditionally, and also earlier work, suggested that in medicine, positionality might not be such a big deal. Actually, the positionality um, literature refers a lot to uh, luxury goods, for example, the car example which I showed, or income, knowing that you do the same job and somebody else earns more makes you feel less happy with your own salary. And you know, intuitively, one might speculate that this kind of plays less of a role in healthcare than when people buy fancy cars, for example. But we do find a sizable effect across countries, across groups, all three measure, uh, measures matter. Now, of these, positional motives, and this was in line with earlier work, um, appear to be the weakest predictor. Still significant, but the weakest. Distributional considerations turn out to be the strongest predictor, also when we give people, of course, information about their personal position on the queue. To be honest, I think we might have an external validity issue here with choice experiments. I'm not sure how this would translate to real life where people would be voting for a particular distribution, having them later on in a queue, but society as a whole being happy. Um, I'll kindly give the... Um, yeah, the critics of choice experiments a bone there in the sense that I think this, is a, this could definitely be an issue here. But generally speaking, the robust notion that all these three aspects matter is, I think, safe. Studying these two healthcare systems, the UK and the USA, uh, what do we find? Um, let's start by saying, on many counts, not really so much differences. Okay? When we do kind of find granularity and differences and see what happens, we see that uh, there are a couple of differences. For example, when we look at the socially inclusive, so people thinking about themselves as opposed to about their spouse, we see that self-interest and distributional concerns are more important in the UK than in the USA. Uh, positional concerns turn out to be a bit stronger in the UK than in the USA, but non-significantly so. So you might want to ignore that. Uh, socially, in the socially exclusive situation, we notice that there's distributional concerns become more important in the UK than in the USA. And we find no other differences there. Final slide. Um, what could you take home from this? Self-interest, positional concerns, distributional concerns, they all matter. And for a methodology person like me, the biggest conclusion here is actually we can disentangle them. This is not really an empirical study, although I kind of trust the sample size and the way we did it, but it's, it is a methodological study in the sense that we propose a way to measure these things using all sorts of other data. Now, what implications could this have for health policy? Here goes my disclaimer of the first slide. I could speculate. You're much more clever um, about this than, um, than I am but I'm happy to, uh, to give it a try and hear your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kasper and uh, Esther. You ob obviously build, build up the complexity of the presentations uh, in this uh, whole symposium. So uh, there's a challenging question posed by Kasper at the end. Does anyone dare to give it a shot? As Hester Linksma. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Kasper. Very nice. I don't dare to give it a shot. Um, <laughs> but what I want to ask maybe is related because I was wondering what does it mean in terms of implications that uh, I think typically in healthcare we don't know the positionality. People don't know when other people, when it's their turn and whether it's longer. Or would that, yep. Does that matter for the translation? Yeah, absolutely. So in cases where people wouldn't know the relative position, um, we don't, their preferences then shouldn't matter because people wouldn't have their mental map uh, attuned to the situation in that way. Um, I'm just thinking of some situations like COVID vaccines where people were actually quite well aware of it. By the way, in COVID vaccines, there was a little bit of another trick where people didn't want to be the first in the queue to first have the rest experience some mild blood clots and whatever. Yeah, yeah. but it's a good point. Yeah. I stole the, the <laughs> microphone. Thanks, Gasper. That was a very, very interesting um, presentation, very applicable to healthcare questions. Um, were you able at all, I was wondering, because um, you talk about the four different groups, were you able at all to um, disentangle individual effects within those groups? So for example, did it vary by socioeconomic um, status, uh, race, ethnicity, um, education, any of those uh, individual characteristics? Yep. Yeah, very relevant point. Uh, we didn't, um, which is not the same as not being able to, although to some extent, because I think we limited our um, asking of, uh, about people's backgrounds uh, from the viewpoint of not asking about things that we didn't a priori plan to use in our analysis. Um, I would imagine a lot of heterogeneity in these, um, in these things, which we generally, by the way, see in moral decision making wide variety of very clever and reasonable people in terms of how they respond to these types of questions. Um, so yes, I do expect that. Um, some of it will be relatable to gender, ethnicity, age, etc. Um, but my generic experience is that a whole lot of it is um, not explained by such factors and it just, you know, that's also one of the things we learned by uh, with COVID. It's basically looking at your neighbor or even your spouse or your best friend and then seeing oh boy we do have very different opinions about this yeah. uh, if, if you may continue Mar uh, marine that's okay sorry uh to Kasper, so, so very nice uh, and just to expand a bit on the yeah, observables like uh, age sex uh, maybe socioeconomic status uh, but the only observable is maybe the selection of the the panel you have and this it's a quite smart way, I think, of doing research. Eh? Over 3,000 participants in a relatively cheap way compared to epidemiological studies. Uh, but this distributional consideration, might you expect that these panelists, they, they have some concern for society. Otherwise, they would never be in a panel. Yeah. Just a quick question to you, Job. Um, were these people sampled now from a typical um, health market uh, bureau or kind of a, a consumer kind of studies more generally? Yeah. Average consumer. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> so what, Sorry, what, I, what, what, what we understood was an average consumer Still panel, alive. and we Still are in the economic yeah. department here. So yeah, average consumer. Who's that? Yeah. Yeah. No, just just a uh, consumer panel. Uh, so that's also used for voting and for car preferences and whatever. And you have some trust in that. Some. Well, I think that there's something to say to every type of uh, data you use. Uh, of course, it's people who uh, signed up themselves to participate in an online panel. Uh, that's the big but. Uh, sure, yeah. This is a key issue. But that's a very general point, and we'll have more questions then, but uh, very important, some trust. And I think that also relates to the conversation with Jorin. Um, I think we need to be fair about this notion that it's all we're dealing all of us with proxies. It's not, it's not better than that. Some of these proxies are much better than others, but I do think there is a gulf between these kind of uh, surveys and the real thing. But the thing is, the real thing is kind of this uh, mirage. You cannot touch it in many, in many ways. You cannot grab it. We're dealing with proxies and we should all the time say, you know, it's only as good as we think and hope it is, not more. Very wise. Yeah. Yes. And by Peter van Baal. Yes, uh, thank you, Kasper. Very interesting presentation. It's really outside of my comfort zone. But 
I wondered, you, you presented uh, a choice task and you try to disentangle self-interest, positional concerns and distributional considerations, but from my perspective, I saw a lot of also efficiency differences. Eh? So what you interpret as distributional considerations, I would purely interpret that as a difference in efficiency. We have one scenario which much more waiting times in total than in the other. Yeah. I would, but in my sort of uh, view, a distributional concern, then you would keep the mean uh, or the total, you know, constant. Mm -hmm. So how yeah. did you do that? Uh, nice. Yeah, that would have been interesting um, if we would have want to compare, for example, um, equity measures with uh, mini-max measures, etc. But we also wanted to test whether the mean itself was a measure of what people might think this is a good distribution, whatever is best and what we would then call efficient for society. So we wanted to include it, and if, of course, if we want to include it, we need to vary it. I would be a bit cynical, and I would interpret it as simply as efficiency considerations yeah. rather than distribution. But that's not a problem. I would say if that would be your um, label on that distribution, like this is simply the best, it's, it's most efficient, it's the lowest aggregate waiting time. That is a distributional preference, as long as you make it as a citizen and not as a professor. Well, I would say that in a lot of literature, it's not presented in that way. I would argue that in a lot of times, consider the same mean, that's also the example that you had in the beginning, sort of implicitly, same average health, but differently distributed. Not everything to one person, yeah. so, yeah. So, well, the question then is why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you choose the most efficient one? No, why wouldn't you? estimate, try to separate yeah. the efficiency well, No, no, there's the definitely model. good reason for doing that, yeah. in addition to this. Yeah. Yeah. So the next study is coming up, Peter. <laughs> Vivian? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, so if I understood the design correctly, there were four different versions that were randomly assigned to uh, the respondents. So I was just wondering uh, if maybe the effect, uh, the limited effect, could have been influenced by this randomization. So maybe people were less likely to uh, make um, um, uh, uh, outlying uh, preferences, so they would state outlying preferences with a large difference, for example. Uh, and maybe they decided to choose uh, for, uh, I'm struggling with my English at the moment. So. I was wondering, because they made all four designs, if the difference in effect was smaller than if you would have uh, assigned only two out of the four. And um, we assigned everyone to one of the designs. To one of the designs yeah. and not to all four. So you ah, didn't no, okay. randomly assign... No, so we had... It is a bit of a complicated picture uh, indeed. So we asked people to do... Um, two experiments, five choice tasks from behind the veil of ignorance, and 15 where they would get they would get these five questions randomized through the 15 in which their own position is marked, and 10 additional ones. So those are kind of two designs which everyone dealt with. But we had um, four samples in the sense that we had one sample from the USA and one from the UK, and each of those samples were split in half randomly by having some people answer questions for th about themselves and other people answering questions about their loved ones. Okay, so it was a between design exactly. and not a within design. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, good point. Valid okay. point. So that may also explain, but in a different way, uh, the finding. Uh, I'm not sure if I would agree fully. You would hope not, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks Thank for asking. Yeah. We can discuss further in a moment. Yeah. I, s I saw a hand here as well, right? Um, oh, okay. yeah. You indicated that this was a bit so, or that the expectation was that uh, posi positional concerns are less of an issue in, in a health context. But it's waiting time, so you have a health context, but it's waiting time a health feature. Uh, yeah. If this is somebody waiting for a kidney transplantation and it's dialysis, so was there uh, suffering, so to say? Uh, during waiting, so were the yes. consequences of waiting? Ah, or not? yeah, very good point. So this is what we tried to capture with this uh, scale. Um, we asked people to imagine 
that on, what was it, four or five dimensions, they would have a de uh, deterioration in their health during the waiting time. And it includes a lower mobility level, a lower ability to execute your work, um, cognitive, I think, concentration, things like that. So during the waiting time, you would be suffering. It's not just sitting, you know, doing your ordinary life. And did you have variation in that to study whether people captured that and whether it would, would impact their evaluation yeah. of that period? No variation. We already thought we had enough uh, split samples, <laughs> stratification, but valid point. I, I was wondering, Kasper, did, did you conduct this study simply out of scientific curiosity or was there a, a policy consideration behind it? Yeah, I'm afraid the first. Uh, I'm actually not afraid, I'm not afraid to say that, actually, I'm a big proponent of that. Um, as long as we do things like this, uh, I am not ashamed to say that actually the reason behind this was to test the little jealousy aversion thing, uh, for which I designed a metric. Um, that didn't work out, or at least it worked out, but with uh, yeah. Yeah. Sy sy yeah, symmetric yeah. results. But it's important to note that these kind of work, kind of funded by the ERC, which also doesn't ask you, is this relevant for practice? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. we need to communicate about it and talk yeah. to people who are much closer to practice. Can, right? can I challenge you a little bit and ask you, what do you think that the implications for policy are? Yeah. Um, to be honest, I... When I derive policy implications, I do so about topics I know a lot about. In my case, it's transportation and mobility. And then I go to Rijkswaterstaat and the ministry and I, I talk to them about it. In this case, um, I didn't do it, but also for a reason. I just thought, hey, this could be interesting. Of course, we brought Job on board. We had Perhaps many fruitful discussions with him. <laughs> Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm happy to either give the mic to uh, to Job or to have a or to hear from you actually, right? That's also nice if if you see any. Yeah. First Job and then Diana, I see. Yeah. Well, I think <laughs> I, I, I've given it a little bit of thought. So perhaps first the audience, see whether we come up with some interesting thoughts. Well, you have the microphone, so go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, I think when we design policies in healthcare, uh, we always put this distributional considerations way up front. And we think that people care a lot about societal preferences. Um, and I think just having a, a sense of that the, the, all these three different sorts of preferences matter and the relative weights between them, because in the end I would, I had expected a stronger effect of self-interest, for instance, uh, in, in certain part of the design and for instance, people making choices for themselves in the US where you have a private healthcare system. Um, but still, still under, under that condition, distributional considerations were stronger. So I think the basic assumption that distributional considerations are very important in the healthcare sector still uh, holds up. Um, but other things also play a role. Uh, and when designing and communicating policies, I think it's important to take that into consideration. And it might be more applicable in, in the one context than, than in the other, but I think very long ago, uh, we did a study into um, companies buying up spare uh, capacity in hospitals. Yeah, so using uh, operation rooms that are not used in the weekend so that employees could be helped uh, uh, earlier and that gave a lot of negative publicity. Uh, so uh, people, perhaps, if they were employee in one of those firms and would be helped earlier and could go back to work, uh, so their self-interest motives and position of concerns could play a role. But in the end, we all work, or most of us work, and the distribution considerations sort of overtook that part of, of helping people in certain employment uh, considerations first. And so I think it's, it's, it has, it's very relevant within the healthcare sector. Um, and I think COVID also gives a, a nice example of a number of, of, of instances where, in this case, self-interest was waiting a bit longer, yeah, getting a better view of the risks of side effects and the type of side effects. Yeah, Last question is for Diana. Now, I, I'm, I don't have a question. I'm tempted to give it a go 
um, with yeah, an answer. Uh, but I haven't had a chance, obviously, to give it a lot of thought, so maybe it doesn't make any sense. But I guess my takeaway would be that uh, this actually is um, a, a positive result for having regulated markets in healthcare because you can use self-interest to um, stimulate people to make efficient choices, but because position and distribution matters, you can yeah. o you also need regulation. So, Thank you very much. Save my day. That's a nice conclusion. <laughs> thank you for that, uh, Diana. So, Kaspar, thank you very much. Uh, you can take your seats. Um, well, our uh, festive symposium have, co have come to a, a closure. Uh, I would like to thank Esther very much for designing it and putting it together and bringing these interesting topics uh, on the floor. We are now uh, looking very much forward to hearing your inaugural lecture and seeing you shine. So uh, we can all walk together uh, to the Ola from here. So please join us if you want to go there directly from uh, here. Thanks again to all the speakers and to the audience who was uh, nicely and actively Im involved. And also thanks to the people who joined us uh, online. Okay, up to the Ola.